Hi, I'm Sebastian Mader from Penn State University. This is ESC 216, Advanced Field Emission Scanning Electron Microscopy. So this lecture will be lecture one, and it's part of the characterization and testing of nanotechnology structures and materials. Let's begin. A field emission scanning electron microscope is a, a type of microscope, and all microscopes allow us to gather information about a sample. If we look at the terms uh, making up the term field emission scanning electron microscopy, It'll tell us a lot of information about what the tool actually does. Also, um, from now on, I'll primarily be referring to the tool as an FESEM. This is just a simple acronym for the name of the tool. So field emission tells us that we're going to use the magnetic field. Okay? This is actually going to help us um, emit our probe. Um, the scanning term tells us that the probe will be scanned or rastered across the sample surface. Uh, the electron term tells us that the probe is actually an electron. And then microscopy it just tells us that it's going to allow us to view small things that normally we couldn't resolve with the, with the unaided eye. The only two other components needed for this tool to actually work and provide us with uh, useful information would be a detection system and a display. And you know, one note is, you know, easier said than done. These two things, the detector and the display, are actually quite complicated as well. Uh, but anyway, that's where we start our understanding. So let's start with looking at the basic parts of the tool. Uh, vacuum is a necessary component for this tool operation. The column, basically the upper half of the tool, uh, has a high vacuum around 10 to the negative 11 torr. And the, the chamber, the bottom half of the tool, has vacuum levels around 10 to the negative 5 torr. The electron gun up top will, will provide us with the source of the electron beam. And this will then be uh, accelerated down the column. There will be a series of lenses, uh, such as condenser lenses and also an objective lens. And these will help us control the diameter of the beam as well as focus it onto the specimen. There are also a series of apertures, um, and the apertures are basically micron-sized holes in, in a metal disc, or they can be electromagnetic apertures, which block the outer parts of the beam and let the, center, and let the central part of the beam continue down the column. <clears throat> Some other components worth mentioning are the gun valve, this is located right here in the middle of the tool. It's a pressure uh, valve separating the gun and sample chambers. Uh, that's important because if you want to load a sample into the tool, you have to vent the chamber, return it to atmospheric pressure before you can actually open the chamber door. When you do that, the gun valve needs to be closed uh, to prevent a rush of air into the uh, high vacuum part of the instrument. The objective lens is the final lens, which really lets us do the fine-tune uh, focusing onto our specimen. There are deflector coils, which are important for deflecting or rastering the beam across the sample. And finally, there'll be a stage, which holds the specimen and can move in the X, Y, and Z directions, as well as tilt and uh, general rotation. So if we look at these parts in a little more detail, um, and terms worth mentioning are the beam specimen interaction. This is an area that's actually generating signals and can be later detected to produce our image. The detector's job will be to acquire and process these signals, and then the monitor will, will show us on the screen uh, what these signals uh, look like. So here's a little image. We see the beam coming down. Uh, it's being rastered by the deflector coils. It's being focused by the objective lens. We have a detector picking up that signal. We can amplify the signal and send it to a monitor so that we can watch and, and see what's going on in real time. Then there's some feedback loop between our magnification control 
and focus, uh, which is going back to the scan, uh, sorry, deflector coils as well as the objective lens. So let's start at the top with the electron gun. Okay, the purpose of an electron gun is to provide a small, stable beam of electrons with adjustable energy. So there are a few different types of guns, so let's start with thermionic. These types of guns use a large, and you know, by large I mean around 100 micron tungsten hairpin filament or a lanthium hexaboride crystal. But both of them work primarily in the same way. When we send current through these, they get hot, and through resistive joule heating, they provide energy for the electrons to escape from the tip. The beam size coming from these types of guns or tips uh, is on the order of microns. Now in a field emission, we have quite a different uh, style tip. It's actually a sharpened tungsten filament and sharpened to about a hundred nanometer tip diameter, which is much smaller. Um, we also use an electric field to extract or pull the electrons out of that tip. Again, notice if we start with a 100 nanometer uh, spot size or, or beam diameter, and by the time we get to the end and focus it on the sample, we can have a beam spot size on the order of nanometers. So that is a, uh, a huge difference. So the, the two biggest differences between thermionic and field emission is that field emission, you start with a smaller tip, you use uh, an electric field to pull the electrons out of that tip, as opposed to resistive joule heating, and then of course you end up with a much smaller spot size on your sample. So now let's talk about why that's so important, the importance of small spot or small probe size. So if we look at the image below and compare the left and right, we're looking at um, how two images would look different depending on, upon our spot size. So let's pretend the orange is a gold nanoparticle with a 20 nanometer radius and the black represents our uh, probe diameter. So it's the smallest um, kind of diameter of our electron beam as it hits our sample. So if you're scanning and there's no nanoparticles, there's nothing there, then you, then you won't have a, <clears throat> have a signal. So you won't see anything on your, on your screen. But as soon as you hit your sample, then you'll emit some electrons, detect those, and, and you'll start to see that image on your screen. Notice that the larger the spot size, the larger the apparent image will be for that sample. And actually, uh, the further from reality. So a smaller spot size will give us a more accurate depiction of our sample. And this is really why uh, we want the smallest spot size possible. We want a spot size that is smaller than our smallest feature on our sample. That's how we can get a nice resolution. So how exactly do we pull these electrons out of the tip in an FESCM? Well, we use an extraction voltage or a potential difference. And this is set up between the tip and a first anode. So with a certain voltage here, this is like a slice view, imagine an annular disc. So imagine this is like a donut cut in half. And it's producing um, a field here, which is drawing the electrons out of the tip. This really helps to um, overcome the work function of the electrons in that sharpened tungsten filament. Right after that we have a second anode where we can use much higher voltages from 0.5 up to 30,000 uh, volts and uh, this is used to accelerate the beam. So first anode extracts Second anode accelerates uh, the electrons down towards our sample. And again, a higher voltage would mean um, a higher acceleration, and therefore faster moving and, and more penetrating electrons. One important note is that we must absolutely keep this tip free of contaminants. And um, that's the most important reason that this part of the chamber has to be at a very...
uh, low pressure, 10 to the negative 11 torr. Because if there was too much air in there, the tip would quickly oxidize and uh, that would significantly lower the lifetime of the tip. There are also uh, different types of field emission actually. So we said there were different types of tips, thermionic and uh, of field emission, but there are also different types of field emission. There's cold field or cold cathode emission. This is where the electric field lowers the work function, allows electrons to tunnel out of the tip. But there's also thermally assisted field emission, also called hot cathode or Schottky. And this uses heat and a thin nitride coating reaction in addition to the extraction voltage to overcome the energy barrier. So uh, subtle differences here in type of FESEM. So let's look at some of the properties of the electron beam that you might commonly hear people uh, discussing when working with an FESEM. The brightness is the beam current per unit area and solid angle and it increases with accelerating voltage. So this makes sense. We have more, uh, more electrons and therefore a higher beam current per unit area. The probe current is actually the current where the beam interacts with the sample below. This must be sufficient to produce adequate signal to noise ratios. If the probe current's too low, we won't have a good signal. And uh, images will start to appear uh, grainy and noisy. Probe diameter is often called spot size. Again, we mentioned this is the diameter of the beam as it reaches the specimen below. Spatial coherence has to do with the extent to which a wave will interfere with itself over time and uh, electrons can behave as waves. Uh, therefore, it's important to, to understand that a small diameter beam source has a high degree of spatial coherence, which is a good thing. There will be uh, less interference with itself if we start with a small diameter. Also, temporal coherence. Um, this would be, if it were perfect, all electrons would have the exact same wavelength. They would all be traveling at the same velocity and have the same uh, energy. And if they have those properties, then we say there's a high degree of temporal coherence, and that is, of course, our goal. Uh, the energy spread is similar to temporal coherence, where lower energy spreads result in higher resolution imaging. This is particularly important when working at low accelerating voltages. And again, I'll stress the importance of vacuum. Um, coherence, energy spread, and probe diameter and probe current are, are necessary for achieving high resolution. And uh, to keep all these functioning adequately, we, we need the, the low levels of pressure or high vacuum levels uh, to operate the tool. One uh, thing to note is that the mean free path at one atmosphere is 10 to the negative 7 meters, while the mean free path at 10 to the negative 10 tor is 1,000 kilometers. What this means is the mean free path is how far would one gas molecule have to travel before it hits another gas molecule. So let's talk about the lenses. Uh, before we get into um, electromagnetic lenses, I wanted to start with glass lenses, something that we're all familiar with. So if we look at the picture below, we see that we have an object here, we want to view it, we want to magnify it. So we use a, a thick glass lens and it produces an image up here at our image plane, which is, which is uh, larger. We can think about it. The, the rays of photons are coming from the object, they're being refracted, and they're coming to uh, a well-defined point in the image plane. There's a fixed focal point, and the object is in focus. Um, if we want to make the object appear larger, we have to use a different thickness or, or a different lens. If we change the height of the lens, it will change the focal point and the magnification a bit. And also we can use multiple lenses to have an additive magnification effect.
So I think we're all familiar with this idea that uh, in, in a common optical microscope, if you want to go to higher magnification, you just swap in a new lens, which will either be a, a thicker lens with a higher magnification power, or um, it'll have multiple lenses to do the same job. And then, <clears throat> and then you move your uh, sample or the entire upper piece up and down to change your focus. So the lens in an SEM and an FESEM are, are quite different. These are electromagnetic lenses. And it turns out that the object being imaged is not your sample. The object being imaged is actually the, the electron beam as it leaves the gun. Okay. The first lens the beam travels through is a condenser lens, which actually kind of widens the beam. Then an objective lens will demagnify or, or bring that beam back together and finally focus it onto the specimen. And um, as far as coarse and fine focus, coarse focus could be considered changing the working distance, and this would mean changing um, the height of your sample, which would change its distance <coughs> between the um, objective lens and the sample itself. And then a fine focus would actually be uh, changing the current to the objective lens, which we'll talk about in a second here. So here's another picture. Uh, we can think about, uh, again, it's not a glass lens, but for this cartoon, we're, we're just imagining how this works. We would have a condenser lens, some apertures you see, then an objective lens, and then the final specimen. So we can use that final objective lens to finally focus the beam. A couple notes. A stronger condensing lens will give us a smaller beam diameter and smaller spot size. That's good. It'll give us a better resolution. However, more beam will be blocked by the aperture. You can see parts of this beam are being blocked here. If that occurs too much, we'll get decreased probe current. If the probe current's too low, we'll lose the ability to pr produce images with necessary contrast and signal-to-noise ratio. So you're going to see shortly that there are a lot of different factors to consider when deciding how to set up your FESEM um, depending upon what image you're sampling or, or what you want to get out of your image. So how do these lenses actually work? Well, we have in green here, you can imagine uh, a coil of copper wire inside a, a hollow cylinder, which is called the pole piece. This produces a magnetic field within the bore. So when we pass a current through this coiled wire, it produces a magnetic field inside, um, kind of like this. We can see the field lines here in red. This will converge or diverge the beam as it passes. Um, the electrons passing through here are actually subjected to, to two forces, one parallel uh, to the bore and one parallel to the lens. Basically the net result is that we'll have um, a spiraling of the electrons. So they will start to spiral in tighter and tighter, and then they'll actually spiral out and, and get larger like this. This would be uh, like an example of the condenser lens. And then for the objective lens, it would be the opposite effect where we would start wider and end uh, with a narrower beam. Um, some important things to note are that the magnetic field is always weaker in the center and stronger towards the outside. So the further electrons stray from the center, the greater will be their deflection back towards the center. And even though we're talking about deflection and we see these large angles here, the true angles of deflection are actually uh, less than 1% in uh, electromagnetic lens, which is very different from, from glass and optical lenses. Now, as these electrons pass through these electromagnetic lenses, there are some aberrations uh, or distortions which can occur uh, similar to what happens when light is traveling through glass lenses. 
The reason this occurs is because there are always defects inherent in, in all lenses. For example, the rays coming from a single point will not come to share the exact same focal point in the image plane. So instead of a perfectly, uh, you know, infinitely small focal point, the result will be uh, what, what is often uh, called a disk of minimum confusion. Part of the reason is, remember we said the outer electrons uh, closer to the bore will, will experience a greater uh, deflection and because of that they won't end up in the same point as the uh, the ones going kind of down the center of the bore. There are also factors such as the energy or speed of the electrons which will uh, result in this disk of minimum confusion. So one example of a lens aberration is spherical aberration and this is kind of the one I, I just talked about. Um, the electrons further from the axis are subjected to stronger forces, so we get a series of focal points. This turns out to be the principal limiting factor for SEM resolving power. Now here's what I mean by limiting. We said earlier that the resolving power of an FESEM is on the order of nanometers. So let's say for a certain tool your resolution is 2 nanometers. If you think about how small an electron really is, then you would think if I'm shooting electrons down at a sample, I should have a resolution around the size of an electron. That's not the case. Um, if you had a single file of electrons and no aberration and none of this, then yeah, you would have a resolution, um, you know, around picometers or below. But the reason our resolution is only, you know, and I say only, but it's still an amazing resolution. The reason it's only 2 nanometers is because of this spherical aberration and, and other aberrations inherent in the lenses. Uh, one thing we can use to try to minimize this effect is apertures. So apertures are these either holes in metal discs or they could be a, a magnetic uh, type of aperture. And they basically block outer parts of the beam and they reduce uh, the area or spot size. But remember, if we block too much, we'll have a current that is too small. Chromatic aberration is another one I alluded to. Um, because all the electrons have a broad spectrum of energies, they're not all traveling at the exact same velocity. Then some will be bent more or less than others. This also contributes to that disk of minimum confusion and this is um, particularly problematic at low accelerating voltages. Uh, by the way, the reason these are called chromatic aberrations is if there were photons traveling at different speeds, having different energies, you could calculate their wavelengths and um, uh, you know, their wavelengths would be in the nanometer range you know, 300 to 700, we'd, we'd be able to see different colors in different regions, you know, much like a prism. So a prism is kind of making use of um, this spherical aberration or the fact that um, particles of different energies bend at different angles. Uh, there's another type of aberration called stigmatism. And this occurs because the lenses can't, are not machined to perfect symmetry. So the beam will always be wider or narrower at certain places. The net effect is that the images will appear elongated. Here are two examples. If it's um, elongated in the horizontal direction, then our image will appear elongated in the horizontal direction. And the same applies for the vertical direction. We'll actually use um, um, what's called a stigmator lens or stigmator coil to produce magnetic field in in the correct places to kind of squeeze the beam uh, back to a spherical shape and this will give us a more accurate depiction of our sample. So now let's talk about some of the operator controls and considerations you have when you're sitting down to use the tool yourself. Let's talk about 
something which seems easy but it's a little bit more complicated and that's the idea of brightness so on your screen you'll have a series of pixels in the grayscale and your brightness um, actually begins as a base level and it comes from the signal being input from your detector this signal can be further manipulated by changing the DC level on the amplifier and adjusting that base level okay so that's what's happening when you're increasing the brightness you're actually increasing uh, the gain and remember when you're looking at an image white means many electrons are being emitted and detected black will mean fewer or no electrons are being emitted and detected contrast is another control knob that we have um, contrast is basically the spread or distribution of signals up from that baseline which you set with your brightness this can again be var uh, varied with amplifier gain and typically your goal is to achieve maximum dynamic range this means that you want to have the greatest difference between the peak black and peak white levels. Um, one way I like to think about it is if you've ever taken an art class and uh, you were sketching things with pencil and your teacher said, oh, you're not, you know, everything's either black or white, you're not making good use of the grayscale as well. You want to make use of the grayscale. You want to have the largest variety of, uh, of black white colors. This should help explain that and one good technique when using the tool is to begin by lowering the contrast very low then increase the brightness until the image is just visible once you've done that then you can go ahead and increase the contrast until the image shows the greatest dynamic range and that dynamic range is usually what's most appealing uh, visually to the user, although there is some uh, objectivity involved. But if we look at these different samples, um, this image here we're saying is the, has the optimal contrast and brightness. This is uh, too dark, this is too much contrast, too bright, and not enough contrast. And you basically get better and better at this the more experience you have with the tool. So let's talk about accelerating voltage. Um, we said there were two anodes below the tip of the gun. The first one provided the extraction voltage. The second one provides the accelerating voltage. This can typically be varied, again, from 1 to 30 kilovolts uh, and produce electron energies from 1 to 30 kilo uh, electron volts. If we increase the accelerating voltage, here's what's going to happen. We're going to have decreased lens aberrations, so that's a good thing. We'll have decreased probe diameter and better resolution. So far, so good. We'll also have increased probe current. Uh, this is good. It will give us a, a higher contrast and signal-to-noise ratio. For downfalls, we could have increased charging of non-conductive samples. We could have increased damage to beam-sensitive materials. And we'll also have increased beam penetration. Uh, basically, the beam will penetrate deeper into the specimen, and this will obscure some of the surface information. So here are two images. The left is at 20 kV, the right is at 5 kV. You'll notice that we lose a lot of surface um, contrast or topographic resolution at the higher kV because we're penetrating uh, deeper, and therefore we're getting some of that pixel overlap. Okay, another thing to consider is a probe diameter. We can alter this by altering the current to the condenser lens. So by altering that current we can basically squeeze more or less the beam. When we do that we're changing the um, we're somewhat changing the the working distance or where uh, the focal point lies, whether it's on the surface, above or below our specimen. If we decrease this diameter, we actually get greater resolution, which makes sense, but we may lose good signal to noise ratio uh, because we have less, um, less surface beam interactions.
The net result is that the image will appear sharper. However, it'll also appear grainier, a little bit lower signal to noise ratio. Whereas a larger spot size will be slightly less sharp and will appear more s smooth and, and kind of rounded edges. Now, apertures, we said we could also change, and these could be the metal discs or they could be magnetic, um, electromagnetic apertures. Decreasing the aperture diameter will result in the following, and here's a picture of a small aperture. What's happening is we're going to have decreased lens aberrations and higher resolution, okay? But because we have, uh, basically we've blocked the outer electrons which weren't really doing what we wanted them to do. They weren't finally uh, focused in traveling down that, that path. But we'll also have decreased probe current because we have less electrons reaching the surface. We'll have a smaller convergence angle as well. And what's interesting about this is it'll actually give us an increased depth of focus um, with an increased working distance. What this means is if you use a small aperture, um, it will actually allow you to take a focused image of a sample with large features. So if you have large features and something is in the foreground and the background and you want them to both be in focus, then a good idea would be to increase your uh, working distance and use a smaller aperture. We can also just change the working distance. Now this distance <clears throat> is the distance between the objective lens and the sample being resolved um, if the sample is in focus. If, if your image is not in focus, then it's really just the distance from here, the objective lens, to your focal point. If we increase this working distance, we have a larger probe size, so lower resolution. We have more aberrations, again, lower resolution. But we get an increased depth of field, again, which allows us to uh, you know, take foreground and background images all in focus but overall we have that decreased resolution. So as, you probably, as you're probably seeing already, there are many pros and cons for each factor that we change on this tool. In summary, um, the result of varying aperture size and working distance as it affects resolution and depth of field can be seen in these three pictures. A large aperture and a small working distance will give us high resolution but a small depth of field. So here it is, large aperture, small working distance. We have nice resolution, but you can see the background image is blurry. It is not in focus. If we have a small aperture and a large working distance, as shown here on the right, we we'll have a large depth of field. Both the foreground and background are in focus, but we have a lower resolution uh, as compared to the first image here on the left. So let's talk again about how uh, we would actually adjust uh, stigmation. This is another operator control. It's something we should consider. It's important to correct this, especially at increasing magnifications. In extreme cases of stigmation, we'll see streaking on both sides of focus. What I mean is if you're over or under focused, uh, you'll start to see this type of streaking in your image. It'll look like it's being elongated. And it is being elongated because of the shape of your beam. In order to correct this, we differentially apply current to the stigmator coils surrounding the objective lens. These will kind of uh, warp the beam back to uh, circular or cylindrical shape and therefore give us um, this uh, circular cross-sectional area. In other words, it'll provide us with the truest depiction of our sample. Aperture alignment, often called wobble, is also an important operator control. Uh, the reason this is important is to ensure that the aperture is centered with respect to the 
electron beam and the optical axis. If it's not centered, the image will move while focused. So what you do is you adjust your focus over, under, over, under, over, under. And while you're doing that, if your image is shifting, okay, in X or Y planes, then you know your aperture is not properly aligned. Then you simply adjust the aperture position while flux fluctuating or wobbling that uh, focus. And if once it's correctly aligned, while you're going in and out of focus, your image will not be wobbling. And that's how you know you're in the correct, uh, you have your apertures properly aligned. In old tools, you actually had to do this. So one hand would be moving the focus wheel, one hand would be moving the, uh, the uh, aperture knob. Uh, but in new ones, software controls um, the focal, sorry, the focus wheel, and, and you just basically concentrate on adjusting the aperture alignment. If you have it right, you won't see any movement and your image will just appear to go in and out of focus. That's when you know you're ready. So, some strategies here. Uh, for focus and alignment, you should use the objective lens to focus on your specimen, then increase magnification, then perform a fine focus at that new higher magnification, and then you can repeat. So determine the highest desired magnification, double this, and do your aperture alignment, stigmatism, and focus, and then kind of zoom back out, return to your original desired magnification. This will give you the best, uh, highest resolution image at your desired magnification. Now these are all corrective procedures, which will be done quite often. Uh, so it's important to remember that every time you change the accelerating voltage, spot size, aperture size, working distance, etc., you're going to have to go ahead and uh, adjust your focus, aperture, and uh, stigmatism. Every time you change one of these factors, you need to kind of start over uh, with your focus, working distance, and aperture alignment. All right, so now let's start talking about the signals that may be generated from the interaction of your incoming electron beam and your specimen or sample surface. So the incident electrons, which are the electron beam, can interact with both the specimen electrons and the Coulomb field of the specimen atomic nuclei. The net result can be many different signals, Auger electrons, X-rays, cathode luminescence, backscattered electrons, secondary electrons, and there, are, there will actually also be a variety of uh, transmitted electrons and, and other um, signals being transmitted and coming out the other side of the specimen. But for today, we're just going to focus on um, x-rays a bit, and then mostly our backscattered and secondary electrons. So let's start with secondary electrons. Uh, if we look at the cartoon, we see here this primary. This means that here's an electron from our um, incident beam, our beam being generated, and it's coming down, and it's hitting our sample surface, and it actually strikes an electron in an atom from our sample, and it ejects the electron from the sample. Okay, So we call this an inelastic collision, and it's due to transfer of energy from our incident beam. The important points to highlight are that these electrons have very low energies, less than 50 electron volts, and therefore, because of their low energies, they have very shallow escape depths. It means that these electrons will not escape from the surface, and therefore will not be detected by our detector, unless this atom was very near the, the top of our surface. Also, one thing to note is, this primary electron will move on, the secondary electron leaves, and when it does so, it'll leave a hole behind. Now, if a higher energy electron um, falls to fill that more stable position, it will give off energy. And oftentimes, if it's, if it's uh, a, of high enough um, initial energy, as it falls down, it'll give off energy in the X-ray spectrum. 
And that gives us information as to exactly what type of element uh, this atom was. So again, that X-ray, which can be emitted when an electron falls down from a high energy level to a low energy level, um, will be characteristic. In other words, its energy is unique for the atom from which it came. It's a, this can be uh, considered a type of atomic fingerprint. So all atoms have a unique set of X-rays which they may give off when an electron has been plucked or ejected um, from an inner energy level. Due to their high energies, X-rays, which again are just a type of high energy photon, can be emitted from very large depths. So we can get X-rays uh, coming out of our material uh, from several microns below the surface, whereas the secondary electrons can only escape from uh, the, the upper crust, very shallow escape depth. Backscattered electrons are the last type of signal we want to discuss today. Now these are a bit different than secondary electrons. As you can see, a backscattered electron is actually the same electron which struck our surface. So we see this is the primary or incident beam, it's coming down the gun column, it's focused, it goes through the objective lens, and then it actually interacts uh, with the coulombic force of the nuclei of the atoms in the sample, and it kind of whips around like a boomerang and comes right back out. This is considered an elastic event, and these electrons can have very high energies uh, actually ranging from 50% up to 100% of the initial energy they had on their way in, uh, you know, which again, depending upon our accelerating voltage, may be 0.5 keV to 30 keV. So why is that important? Well, because they have such high energies, then they have huge escape depths, up to 5 microns, and actually they might be above uh, 50 microns below the surface. So backscattered electrons, it's a totally different type of event. They have high energy and therefore very deep escape depths. So we're going to see in a moment how these two different types of electrons can yield different types of information about a sample that we're characterizing. Let's talk a little bit more about this idea of uh, these electrons escaping from different depths. Um, the term interaction volume refers to this 3D volume of space below the sample surface over which the incident beam will spread due to the elastic and inelastic collisions it has with the sample below. This actually may be hundreds of times wider than the spot size, so if this were to scale, um, this kind of light bulb shaped volume down here would have to be much, much larger. But if you notice, secondary electrons, they can only escape from this very shallow depth, whereas backscattered and X-rays, um, backscattered electrons and X-ray photons can escape from these very deep depths. And they also have much wider lateral dimensions and therefore lower resolution. Because remember, if you're detecting things that from this large lateral area, uh, then that's going to be basically acting like a larger uh, probe, okay? Because even if our probe is small, if the electrons we're detecting are from a very large area, then that effectively reduces the resolution of our tool. Some other things to mention about interaction volume, and these should mostly make sense. As the accelerating voltage increases, the beam energy will increase, and so the beam will penetrate further down into the sample. This actually increases the probability of backscattered electron production, um, but due to greater depth, the result is not more emitted backscattered electrons, but just a larger interaction volume. Okay, so the more backscattered electrons are produced, but uh, they're not necessarily more emitted just a larger interaction.
Also, as the atomic number of the sample increases, the beam penetration decreases. I think that makes sense. If there's more uh, bulky protons than the nucleus, uh, we have uh, less beam penetration, and also the interaction volume would decrease. Lastly, if we change the tilt, so you normally you think about a sample being perpendicular to the beam, but you can actually tilt that sample. And if you change the tilt, uh, then the reaction will become smaller and uh, less symmetric. Let's take a closer look at this backscattered signal. First of all, higher atomic number elements will emit more high-energy backscattered electrons, and thus they will appear brighter when they're detected. I'll say that again because it's extremely important. Higher atomic number elements, so heavier elements, think metals and things, things of that nature, will emit more backscattered electrons, and so on our display they will appear brighter. This maximum number of backscattered electrons actually typically travel back along the path uh, when there is no sample tilt. So backscatter electrons, they do that boomerang thing from deep below the surface, and they are actually mostly emitted straight back up uh, towards the column. Um, there is a backscatter coefficient, which is basically the ratio of the backscatter electrons produced for every electron that went into the sample and we can see how that changes a bit excuse me as atomic number increases note that the contrast between heavier elements diminishes um, so what we see here is we have a very high contrast here um, maybe for the first 30 35 elements and then it starts to diminish significantly as we go higher up in atomic As far as backscattered electron contrast, I think we already know how this works. Um, because higher elements emit more backscattered electrons, we said they appear brighter. This allows for compositional differences to be qualitatively analyzed. So if we look here on the right, we see an image of a, uh, uh, like a mineral deposit, and a mineral is basically just a heterogeneous uh, solid mixture of different materials different elements in this case. So all the black dots, these are the heavy, heaviest elements. Uh, the lighters, uh, lighter shades of gray are uh, not quite as heavy. And then the white would be, I'm sorry, I misspoke there. It would be the opposite correlation. So the brightest part of this sample would mean the most backscattered electrons are being produced. And this means, uh, this is a result of having the heaviest elements present. So the brighter it is, this white part would be the heaviest elements. The very dark spots would be the lightest elements, okay, the lightest atomic number elements. And then the shades of gray would be uh, different, different masses <clears throat> from the lightest to the heaviest. Another thing to note is that backscatter detectors are typically um, annular disks, again, donut-shaped disks, and they're mounted just below or inside the column. Again, we said <clears throat> that most backscatter electrons go straight back up through the column, so that makes sense. That would be a good place to have to the detector. And also, if we increase tilt, uh, we will start to lose some backscattered contrast. This is what this is showing that we start to lose some contrast as the tilt um, uh, changes there. Now let's look at our secondary electrons. This is a little tricky, so I don't want to go into too much detail here, but there are actually three different sources we could think about for secondary electrons. The first one is kind of the one we're interested in, and, and this is when the beam interacts with the specimen below and produces secondary electrons and we get a high resolution image. <clears throat> you can see it right here. The second case though is where back, backscattered electrons hit our specimen and don't really produce very good resolution. Uh, what I mean is the backscattered electrons can actually hit our specimen uh, 
cause them to produce secondary electrons, which may be detected. But this will not uh, provide uh, high resolution information. And lastly, you can have secondary electrons be produced from the pole piece or any other metal piece in the, uh, in the chamber area. So this would uh, lead to false information, misinformation. So again, the ones we really want are these right here coming from the interaction of the beam. Now with secondary electrons, interesting to note, these are relatively insensitive to atomic number. So very different than backscattered, which are very sensitive, especially for the uh, you know, first 30 or 40 elements. Secondary electrons are not sensitive to atomic number. So we're not going to see that type of compositional contrast. Um, they actually increase with decreasing accelerating voltage because there's a smaller interaction volume and less backscattered electrons kind of, kind of clouding the picture. Uh, remember, low energy and they have shallow escape depths. The secondary electron coefficient is the ratio of secondary electrons produced for every incident beam sample interaction. And if we plot delta versus z, the atomic number, we see the general trend. Now, if you look here, again, this very weak um, slope throughout this curve is, is basically telling you that the secondary electron signal is insensitive to changes in atomic number. And this can be contrasted to this uh, sharper curve here and, and higher slope for the backscatter. So again, Z contrast is very poor. The only time you can really get nice Z contrast is between um, kind of elemental extremes such as carbon or gold. Otherwise, you can't really get any compositional contrast from secondary electrons. So then the question becomes, well, how do we get contrast from secondary electrons? In other words, if they're insensitive uh, to the elements present, and all atoms emit secondary electrons, then how can we get any contrast from secondary electrons? Well, it turns out it has to do with two factors. One is the interaction volume, and two is the fact that they're, so low, they're such low energy that they can only escape from very shallow depths. Okay, So the phenomena involved here is called the edge effect. And this results from a combination of sample topography and the shape of the interaction volume. <clears throat> so if we look here, let's say we're looking at a flat part of our sample. The beam comes down, we have a little interaction volume. Of course there's going to be many types of particles emitted. Um, some of them will be secondary electrons. And, and let's pretend all these arrows are secondary electrons. Notice the only ones which can escape are the ones that occurred at very shallow depths. These that, that have been generated at lower depths don't have enough energy to escape. So this interaction, let's say, produces four secondary electrons. Those will be detected. If we look over here, though, on the edge of a, of a little hill, a uh, topographic hill on our sample, we see that all these little arrows, many more secondary electrons can escape because all of these electrons now, due to this edge, are close enough uh, even though they have low energy, they're close enough to the edge to escape. So these will all be detected. So what's the net result? Well, the net result is that flat parts will appear black or darker, you know, slightly curved areas a little bit lighter, and edges will appear the brightest, like white. So now we have a means of seeing topographic contrast. Flat areas will be darker, edges will be white, and then we'll have shades of gray in between. Also, if we increase the tilt in our sample, we actually have um, the electrons travel greater distances or spend more time near the sample surface. And so tilting a sample will actually yield more secondary electrons. We see that here. There's a secondary electron coefficient uh, increases as we increase tilt. So this is the opposite of what we saw for backscatter. So putting the two together, backscattered, remember, have high Z contrast, secondary, do not.
Secondary rely on the edge effect and tilt for contrast. Backscatters have much higher energies. Secondary have low energies. Also, backscatter electrons will occur over a broader spectrum because there are many paths that can occur before ejection. Secondary energies have a narrow, um, a narrowly dispersed energy spectrum due to the shallow escape depths. So if we look at the, the energy spectrum, backscattered is broader, secondary much tighter. Here we see atomic contrast, pretty good for backscatter, almost nothing for secondary. Next up will be a discussion of detectors and I'm going to save this, this topic and the remaining topics for lecture two.